Hello horse racing fans and welcome back to another horse racing story. Today's horse racing story will be in light of Secret Oath trying to become the seventh filly ever to win the Preakness Stakes. As there is definitely a bit of history when it comes to those special six fillies that not many people know. We all know of horses like Rachel Alexandra and Swiss Skydiver winning the Preakness in relatively recent memory, but not nearly as many casual racegoers are aware of the first four fillies who won the Preakness Stakes in the first quarter of the 20th century. And that's what this video is going to be about. We will be talking about some old, some new, some familiar, and some obscure racehorses over the history of the Preakness Stakes, and giving a more broad picture of how fillies have left their hoof print on the Preakness Stakes as a whole. Here are the fillies of the Preakness Stakes. Our story begins in the 1903 running of the Preakness Stakes, held in New York. And you might think I misspoke there, because usually the Belmont Stakes is the New York Triple Crown race. However, during the years 1890 all the way to 1908, the Preakness Stakes was not run in Baltimore. In 1890, it was held at Morris Park, which fun fact was also where the Belmont Stakes that year was held, making 1890 the only year that two Triple Crown races were held at the same track. But I digress. For the 1903 running of the Preakness Stakes, it was held at Gravesend Park, a defunct New York racetrack and it was where Flo Caroline became the first filly to win the Preakness Stakes. Not much is known about her, not even her racing record, and all that's left is this photograph of a race that she lost. However, she is still documented as the first winner of the Preakness Stakes, even though that very race carried none of the staples that we know of the Preakness Stakes today. It was restricted to horses who had not yet won a race of a value of $3,000 or more, which also happened to be the purse of the Preakness that year. It was run at a mile and 70 yards, and as mentioned before, it was run in New York. And yet the race that she did win was in fact called the Preakness Stakes, and is still considered an official running. Just three years later, Whimsical became the second filly to win the Preakness Stakes, and it was just as dissimilar to the race we currently know as Flo Caroline's running. The only slight difference was that that restriction I had previously mentioned got upped. Now it was for three-year-olds who had not yet won a race worth $5,000. And when it comes to that year's victor, Whimsical, she's a bit better documented, with an official record of 16 career starts, 7 victories, and only one off-the-board placing. And if there's one other cool fact to mention about Whimsical, it's the fact that in a previous race, she actually faced off against the 1905 winner of the Preakness, Carnagorm, and beat him. And keep in mind that she was a 3-year-old filly, and Carnagorm was an older male horse which is certainly quite impressive and not something you see very much today. Although, there is a pretty modern example of something like this, but we're talking about her later. For now, we jump to 1915, which was the first time that a filly won the Preakness Stakes that was held at Pimlico Racecourse. And that year's winner was named Rhine Maiden. And unfortunately for her, she had her thunder stolen by another filly who defeated the boys in an American classic. Her name was Regret, and she became the first of three fillies ever to win the Kentucky Derby a race that all y'all watching this video have definitely heard of. And it's partially thanks to Regret, because her victory in the race made the Kentucky Derby front page news for the third consecutive year, and thus helping legitimize the Kentucky Derby as a major sporting event, a title that it's been able to keep over 107 years after Regret won the race. And that's probably why you've never heard of Ryan Maiden, because Regret did what she did just a little bit before her. And also, it's not really helped by the fact that she won the Preakness over 100 years ago. But now you know her name, and that 1915 was probably one of the best times to be a three-year-old filly, with Regret and Ryan Maiden teaming up to win two of the three jewels of the American Triple Crown against the boys. And then, just nine years later, came Nellie Morse, who became the fourth filly to win the Preakness Stakes. But she didn't just win the Preakness Stakes, she also took the Pimlico Oaks, which is better known now as the Black Eyed Susan Stakes. Today, the Black Eyed Susan is raced only a day before the Preakness Stakes, so it's safe to say we're not going to see another horse win both the Black Eyed Susan and the Preakness Stakes ever again. But as well as being a great racehorse, Nellie Morris was also a great broodmare, not something you always see. Usually horses have one or the other, but Nellie Morris had both, most notably producing the filly Nellie Flagg, who ran in the 1935 Kentucky Derby as one of the favorites, and also was the first Kentucky Derby mount of legendary jockey Eddie Arcaro. However, she didn't win. Instead, the race was won by a horse named Omaha. Soon after, she would rematch against Omaha in the Preakness Stakes, trying to repeat the efforts of her mother. However, she lost again, and Omaha took the Preakness. Shortly after, Omaha then took the Belmont and became the third Triple Crown winner. 
After this, there would be a long drought before another filly won the Preakness Stakes. In those ensuing 85 years of Preakness, only three fillies dared to try and win it. The most controversial of which being in 1980, when after becoming just the second filly ever to win the Kentucky Derby after the aforementioned regret, Genuine Risk tried to also win the Preakness Stakes. However, in a true example of rough riding, Angel Cordero purposely drifted to the outside, taking Genuine Risk with him and causing her to lose significant ground. There were also rumors that Angel Cordero hit Genuine Risk in the face with a whip. However, there is no way to actually prove this happened. What we do know is that Codex and Genuine Risk went very wide into the far turn, and after that, Codex opened up four lengths and one. Despite an inquiry and a court case, Codex remained the winner despite the controversial tactics employed by Angel Cordero, and thus, Genuine Risk was not the winner of the Preakness, regardless of how much people believe she deserved it. Then, just eight years later, Winning Colors became the third and last filly to win the Kentucky Derby, and then tried to win the Preakness. No controversy this time, instead Winning Colors was simply outcompeted by the legendary Risen Star who could be argued as one of the greatest, if not the greatest son, of the Almighty Secretariat. But after another 21 years following Winning Colors' defeat, we finally got the filthy we were looking for. She doesn't need much of an introduction, she is definitely the most well-known of the six horses we're talking about. The one, the only, Rachel Alexandra. And while she ended up winning the race, it wasn't as set in stone as some people think. Of course, after winning the Kentucky Oaks by 20 lengths, she couldn't have looked any better going into the Preakness Stakes. But what really set her fate as the Preakness winner was Calvin Burrell. Calvin Burrell made a historic double in 2009, riding both the winners of the Kentucky Oaks and the Kentucky Derby, which he did on Mind That Bird at odds of 50 to 1. Mind That Bird was also going to run in the Preakness Stakes, so he had to make the choice, the Star Philly or the Colt. And in the sense that history repeats itself, Calvin Burrell chose the filly, akin to how Asinto Vasquez chose Ruffian over Foolish Pleasure in the Great Match Race. But I digress. What's important here is that Calvin Burrell was the reason that Mind That Bird ever won the Kentucky Derby, the same way that Rich Strike was only a Kentucky Derby winner thanks to the great riding of Sony Leon and a pace meltdown. Without Calvin Burrell, Mike Smith had to ride Mind That Bird, and predictably, Mike Smith did not ride Mind That Bird to his fullest potential. Not because Mike Smith was a bad rider, but because Calvin Burrell knew him better. And because of that, Mind That Bird had a way less smooth trip, while Rachel Alexandra had everything her own way. Even with all that unnecessary trouble that Mike Smith put Mind That Bird through, he still came within two lengths of passing Rachel Alexandra, making that race seem a bit closer than many people realized. And that's not me ragging on Rachel Alexandra, that's more me just trying to give some extra attention to mind that bird. Because he did run a winning race, it was just a matter of Calvin Burrell choosing Rachel Alexandra instead. Following this though, their fates would be completely different. Mind That Bird would never win another race, and Rachel Alexandra would run what is in my opinion, the greatest season by any filly in history. Running 8 times total, winning 4 grade 1 races, 3 of them against males. Not just the Preakness, she went on to win the Haskell Invitational, and then the Woodward Stakes against older male horses, which included Asiatic Boy, who was second in the Dubai World Cup to the mighty Curlin, as well as grade 1 winners Macho Again and Bulls Bay. You don't get any better as a female racehorse than beating the best three-year-old Colts twice and then beating older males while still being a three-year-old filly. Not even Zenyatta becoming the first mare ever to win the Breeders' Cup Classic was enough to stop Rachel Alexandra from becoming Horse of the Year, which in my opinion was most definitely the right call. And if we're talking about all-time greatest seasons by American racehorses, I can only think of two horses that had more impressive seasons, Cigar and Dr. Fager. And those are some of the greatest horses in history. So safe to say, Rachel Alexandra deserves all the legendary status she has. But even after she became the first filly to win the Preakness in over 85 years, there was still one more filly who decided to add her name to the list. And that would be in the infamous year of 2020. One of the worst years to ever be alive. However, it was also a year of history, in a ton of ways. For one, the Preakness and the Triple Crown in general was completely backwards. The Kentucky Derby was run in September, and the Preakness was ran in October, just a month before the Breeders' Cup. So of course, things didn't exactly go according to tradition. After Authentic won a Kentucky Derby that was anything but, it was time for the Preakness Stakes a whole month after the Kentucky Derby. And alongside Authentic was a heavily campaigned chestnut filly who had already raised eight times that year. 
which included a win in the Grade 1 Alabama Stakes at a mile and a quarter. She even tried the boys, but she didn't win, coming second in the Toyota Bluegrass Stakes to Art Collector. But she would get vindication in the Preakness, as Art Collector finished near the back of the pack. Meanwhile, Swiss Skydiver sucker punched Authentic by sneaking up on the inside rail, taking over the lead from Authentic and leading them into the top of the stretch. At this point in the race, it looked like Authentic was just going to pass her, but the further into the stretch they got, the more you realize she was here to stay, as she did not budge one bit, continuing to stick that head of hers in front of Authentic until they hit the wire. And when they crossed the finish line, she ran the fastest Preakness stakes ever in history, with the exception of Secretariat. And even that can be debated, because Secretariat didn't have an official time for the Preakness because the clock malfunctioned, so for the fastest official time for the Preakness stakes, it goes to Swiss Skydiver. But you could still put quotations on the race, considering it was run in October and not May. And come to think of it, with the exception of Rachel Alexandra, each of the Philly winners of the Preakness Stakes had something within the Preakness Stakes itself that was not traditional, of what we know of the Preakness today. For example, the first two Phillies to win the Preakness Stakes, the race was held in New York and ran at a mile and 70 yards, then the next two runnings of the Preakness Stakes won by Phillies were ran at a mile and an eighth, and then lastly with Swiss Skydiver, the race was held in October rather than May thanks to COVID. Only Rachel Alexandra ran a perfectly traditional Preakness Stakes on the third week of May at a mile and three sixteenths. And now Secret Oath hopes to do the exact same thing tomorrow. And that is where our story concludes for now. We have seen the six Phillies who have currently won the Preakness Stakes against males, and maybe even a seventh in our midst. So with all that said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and learned something new about the history of the Preakness from the perspective of the ladies, and I hope you're also excited for tomorrow's big race. See you guys at the Preakness.